In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St Mark. With the coming of evening, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him, just as he was, in the boat, and there were other boats with him. Then it began to blow a gale, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that it was almost swamped. But he was in the stern, his head on the cushion, asleep. They woke him and said to him, Master, do you not care? We are going down. And he woke up and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Quiet now, be calm. And the wind dropped, and all was calm again. Then he said to them, Why are you so frightened? How is it that you have no faith? They were filled with awe, and said to one another, Who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So we'll look first at the literal sense of this gospel passage. And what we see is that we're in chapter four of Mark's gospel at the very end of the chapter. Jesus has spent the majority of this part of the gospel teaching in the form of parables. So at the very beginning of chapter four, we read, Again he began to teach by the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. So the fact that Jesus is teaching beside the sea at the beginning of this passage explains to us what Jesus means when he says at the beginning of the passage, let us cross over to the other side. He's talking about the other side of the sea where he has been teaching, which is the Sea of Galilee, also called the Lake of Tiberias. Now, the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake in modern day Israel, whose main source is the Jordan River. And Galilee was an area where Jewish people, living by the law of Moses, had to share their life with Gentile peoples, as it was surrounded by Gentile territory. And there was a certain degree of contamination, if you like, or corruption, in terms of their religious practice. Hence, in the book of Isaiah, Galilee is referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles, or Galilee of the Nations. So we read in Isaiah chapter 9, in the former time, he, that's God, brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali refer to two of the lost tribes of Israel, tribes who gave up their Jewish identity and were subsumed into the surrounding nations. So Galilee is associated with the Gentiles, it's associated with non-Jewish cultures and religions, people who are not the people of God, and with threats to Jewish belief and practice. And yet, this is where Jesus' pub Jesus's public ministry begins. Not just Mark, but also Matthew and Luke, record the Sea of Galilee as being the place where the first disciples are called, and all three synoptics mention Jesus' teaching and working miracles in Galilee. And this fits in with the presentation of Galilee and the prophecies concerning Galilee in the book of Isaiah, because there Galilee also becomes associated with the coming of the Messiah. So Isaiah prophesies that God will make glorious Galilee of the nations in the latter time, which is like the last era of history, the messianic era, the time when God sends his chosen one to bring salvation and vindication to his chosen people. So Galilee, Isaiah tells us, is a place of great significance in salvation history. And in fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew quotes Isaiah when talking about Galilee. We read in Matthew chapter 4, He, that's Jesus, left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, 
in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So this Galilee of the Gentiles, Galilee of the nations, is where Jesus begins his ministry of preaching, teaching and healing. And this is the location for Mark chapter 4. And in fact, this sea, the Sea of Galilee, remains the fixed point of reference for basically all of Jesus's ministry in Mark up until the middle of chapter 8, when they move to the village of Bethsaida. So the Sea of Galilee is where we are geographically. But where are we in terms of the structure of Mark's gospel? Well, there are kind of two ways to look at the structure of Mark's gospel. And one of them we've actually talked about in previous Sunday Gospel podcasts. It's the idea that Mark's gospel is structured around three theophanies. So three revelations of God, which are the baptism of the Lord, the transfiguration of the Lord and the crucifixion. And at each one of these theophanies, Jesus is proclaimed to be the Son of God. The first two times by the voice of God the Father, and the third and final time at the crucifixion by the centurion at the foot of the cross. So that's one way of looking at the structure of Mark's gospel. It's all about these three theophanies. But another way of looking at the structure of Mark's gospel is the idea that it's structured around two professions of faith. The first being Peter's profession of faith in Mark chapter 8, and the second being the centurion's profession of faith in Mark 15. So Peter's profession of faith takes place before the transfiguration, and the centurion's profession of faith takes place at the crucifixion. And so you'll be able to see that there's quite a bit of overlap between these two ways of looking at Mark's gospel, because each of these two professions of faith is associated with one of the theophanies, one of these acts of God by which God reveals who he is. And both of these ways of looking at Mark's gospel, these two structures, help us to understand the significance of chapter four in Mark's gospel, because chapter four comes after the the first theophany, which is the baptism of the Lord in Mark chapter one, but it comes before the first profession of faith, Peter's profession of faith in Mark chapter 8. Now, we know that Jesus, up until this point in chapter 4, has been surrounded by a crowd of people wanting to hear his teaching. But we also hear that when he withdraws in the boat, his disciples come with him. We find out a little more about the disciples in this part of the Gospel of Mark by looking at what has just come before this Gospel passage. It's at the end of the series of parables in Mark chapter four. So we read with many such parables, he, that's Jesus, spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So we're starting to see now that the disciples have a particularly close, particularly privileged, if you like, relationship with Jesus. He explains the meaning of his parables in private to them. And when Jesus is seeking solace, when he's withdrawing with a crowd hungry for his teaching, the disciples go with him. The disciples are those whom Jesus has called and chosen to follow him and to learn from him. And it's significant that this particular gospel passage features the disciples because this particular part of Mark's gospel is really focused on discipleship and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So the first disciples were called in the very first chapter of Mark by the Sea of Galilee. So we read in Mark chapter one, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. Now, it's worth reflecting a bit on the fact that Jesus' very first disciples were fishermen because they would have been familiar with boats and with life on the water, and they would therefore have presumably experienced storms before. So the fact that the storm terrifies even these experienced fishermen 
gives us a bit of a clue as to how huge and foreboding this particular storm was. Anyway, by the time we get to the calling of Levi or Matthew in chapter two of Mark's gospel, Jesus appears to have already a whole crowd of disciples. In fact, he has enough disciples that in chapter three, he can select 12 of them and appoint them as apostles. Apostle meaning one who has been sent out. So we read in Mark chapter three, he went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted and they came to him and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. So in chapter three, the chapter just before chapter four of Mark's gospel, we've had the calling of the apostles, the selection of the apostles. So chapter four comes in a part of Mark's gospel that's very much focused on discipleship. And in fact, it's in this very chapter, chapter four, that the importance of discipleship really, really comes to the fore. The very first parable we hear in chapter four is the parable of the sower, where Jesus contrasts different types of soil in which seed can try to grow. And when he goes on to explain the parable to his disciples, he says, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. So the seed is in fact the word of God, the message of revelation. And then Jesus goes through each type of soil and its receptivity to the seed, explaining that these types of soil are actually different human responses to the revelation of God. He finishes off saying, others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. So this parable of the sower that begins Mark chapter four, the chapter that we're in for our gospel passage this Sunday, is like the context for everything that comes afterwards. It's the context for everything we learn about discipleship in this chapter, including this incident with the calming of the storm. So that's our literal sense of the passage. We're going to move on now to the three spiritual senses. We're going to begin with the allegorical sense and ask ourselves, where can we find God in this passage? And we're going to see that God is revealed in the action of Jesus, who reveals himself to be sovereign, not only the storm, but also over all evil in created reality. And we're going to move on to the anagogical sense, and we're going to find the church in the image of the boat, the community of Christ's disciples shielded by his grace by the storms of a sinful world. And then finally, we'll turn to the moral sense and we'll have a look at where we can find the human person. And we'll be confronted by the question, will we as individual Christians, as individual disciples of Jesus, will we act in fear or in faith when we encounter the storms of life? So we'll look first at the allegorical sense of this passage, in other words, where we can find God. And we're going to focus in on the disciples' question at the very end of the passage. Who can this be? Who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. In many ways, this question, who can this be, is the question that's at the very heart of Mark's gospel, which is really focused on the identity of Jesus. Not the teaching or the miracles so much, but the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? And relatedly, who will his disciples profess him to be? As Jesus asks Peter in Mark chapter 8, who do you say that I am? Now, what has prompted this question, who can this be, from the disciples in this particular passage from Mark 4, is the fact that Jesus has just calmed a storm. Now, as faithful Second Temple Jews, the disciples will have known that in the scriptures, the calming of storms, the calming of seas, the controlling of nature is the sole preserve of God and not of any human being. If we look in the Psalms, if we look first at Psalm 89, we read, O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. 
And if we look at Psalm 93, we read, More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. And finally, in Psalm 107, we read, They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. So Jesus is performing an act which the scriptures are very clear is a divine act. There is a clear connection here between how God reveals himself in the Old Testament and how he is now revealing himself in the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son. Through this passage, we understand how the Old Testament prepares us for Jesus and how Jesus gives meaning to the Old Testament. And this is exactly what the church teaches about the Old Testament in a document from the Second Vatican Council called De Verbum on Divine Revelation. So we read in De Verbum, paragraph 15, the principal purpose to which the plan of the Old Covenant was directed was to prepare for the coming of Christ, the Redeemer of all and of the Messianic Kingdom, to announce this coming by prophecy and to indicate its meaning by various types. And we'll talk a bit about what the church means by types a little later. We go on to read in De Verbum, Now the books of the Old Testament, in accordance with the state of mankind before the time of salvation established by Christ, reveal to all men the knowledge of God and of man, and the ways in which God, just and merciful, deals with men. So the Old Testament, which tells us that God has sovereign power over the seas, the storms, the waves, has helped us to see Jesus as God, to understand Jesus as God in this gospel passage. Jesus has absolute sovereignty over the natural world, which, as he is God, is his creation. This is what is revealed on the Sea of Galilee. Now, what's interesting here is that the chaos of the storm, which is subdued by Jesus, is presented to us in such a way that it sounds a bit like an exorcism. In other words, the calming of the storm sounds a bit like the casting out of a demon or an evil spirit from a person. Because what we read in the passage is that Jesus rebukes the wind. He commands the sea, quiet now, be calm. He rebukes. Now, the word for rebuke in Greek is epitimao, and it's a verb that's often used to describe Jesus performing an exorcism. So, for instance, we get it in Mark 9. We read, When Jesus saw that a multitude came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. So the word rebuked here is used for an exorcism. We also get it in Matthew chapter 17 at another exorcism. We read, and Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Now, another interesting use of epitomao is in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus heals the mother-in-law of Simon Peter. He heals her of a fever, and he rebukes the fever as though it were an evil spirit. So we read, And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up, and waited on them. So by applying the language of exorcism to the healing of disease and the controlling of violent storms, the Gospels are underlining Jesus' sovereign mastery over all forms of danger, suffering and disorder in the natural world. Just as Jesus can master the spiritual evil of demonic possession, he can also master all the evils of fallen material creation, such as illness, and the danger of death and destruction that comes with a raging storm. Now, given all of this, there really is only one answer to the disciples' question, who can this be? The answer is, Jesus is God. And we can think back now to the beginning of Mark chapter 4, and how the scene was set for this particular passage of the Gospel by the parable of the sower. If you like, what we've seen in this gospel passage is that the sower has sowed the word. Jesus has come into the world and revealed himself as God. Now we've got to think about the soil into which the word has been sown. In other words, how do the people around Jesus, the disciples, 
respond to Jesus. And we're going to turn now to another of the spiritual senses of this passage, the moral sense. In other words, where we can find the human person. What can we learn about how we are called to live as individual Christians in right relationship with God? How might we be called to act and be in the power of God's grace? And to answer these questions, we're going to focus in on Jesus' own question to the disciples. Why are you so frightened? How is it that you have no faith? Now, we've seen that in Mark's gospel, God reveals himself and then people respond in faith. That's the structure. We think about the three theophanies where God reveals himself, the baptism of the Lord, the transfiguration of the Lord and the crucifixion, the passion, death and resurrection. God reveals himself and then people respond in faith. So Peter makes his profession of faith. The centurion makes his profession of faith. That's the structure of Mark's gospel. God reveals himself. Humanity responds in faith. What's happened here is that the disciples have not acted in faith. They've acted in fear. They've been frightened. Jesus has contrasted their fright with faith. He set up a contrast between the two. And this contrast between fear and faith is typical of Mark's gospel. We might think that the obvious thing to contrast with faith is actually doubt. And it's true that when the catechism talks about doubt, it does contrast it with faith. It talks about it as an obstacle to faith. So we read in paragraph 2088 of the catechism, there are various ways of sinning against faith. Voluntary doubt about the faith disregards or refuses to hold as true what God has revealed and the church proposes for belief. Involuntary doubt refers to hesitation in believing, difficulty in overcoming objections connected with the faith, or also anxiety aroused by its obscurity. So doubt is indeed contrasted with faith, it's an impediment to faith. But St Mark in his gospel is much more interested in fear as an impediment to faith. And relatedly, fear as something which is healed and overcome by faith. Now, we're really going to see this in next week's gospel for the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time from Mark chapter 5, when Jesus heals the hemorrhaging woman and raises Jairus' daughter to life. Here is a sneak peek of next week's gospel. We read in Mark chapter 5, The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This is Jesus. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Then we hear about Jairus and his daughter. We read, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house, that's Jairus's house, to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. So this catechesis on fear and faith that we're going to receive in next Sunday's gospel from Mark 5 is kind of prepared for by this Sunday's gospel from Mark 4, where Jesus shows the disciples that their reaction to the storm is rooted in fear. It's rooted in a lack of trust in Jesus, a lack of trust in his protective divine power. If they had acted in faith, they wouldn't have been frightened. They wouldn't have panicked. Now let's think about what this tells us about our faith. As Catholics, we know that our faith is a gift from God. It's a gift we received at baptism, and it can't be simply wiped out or taken away from us. It's a theological virtue, the church teaches. That's a big phrase. What does it mean? Well, the Catechism tells us in paragraph 1833 that virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do good. And the theological virtues, which are faith, hope and love, adapt man's faculties for participation in the divine nature. That's from paragraph 1812. And how does faith do that? 
By faith, we believe in God and believe all that he has revealed to us and that Holy Church profess, proposes for our belief. That's paragraph 1842 of the Catechism. So we know as Catholics that faith is far more than just an emotion or a thought. It's not something transient that comes and goes based on the situation. Instead, it's a habitual and firm disposition, to use the language of the Catechism, which God gives us to adapt our human faculties, such as the ability to know and to trust, for life with him. So this knowledge and trust is ordered towards knowledge and trust of God. But nevertheless, we do have to be honest, sometimes it feels like, or it seems like, our faith just comes and goes. Even though we know that we've received the gift of faith in baptism, sometimes the cares of the world, our sadness and our anxiety, the things that frustrate or anger us or frighten us, can overwhelm us, like the waves overwhelming the boat in a storm. Now, St Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, he was a, a very pastorally minded preacher. He knew all about this. So when he preached on the calming of the storm back in the fourth century, he was talking about St. Matthew's account of this incident rather than St. Mark's. He drew out the moral sense of this passage by linking the disciples in the boat to our own selves. So St. Augustine said in his sermon, the people sailing in the boat are souls crossing the present age on a paltry piece of wood. We are all of us temples of God, and every one of us is sailing a boat in his heart, and we don't suffer shipwreck if we think good thoughts. He goes on to give a few examples. You have heard an insult. It's a high wind. You've gotten angry. It's a wave. So as the wind blows and the waves break, the boat is in peril, your heart is in peril, your heart is tossed about. When you hear the insult, you are eager to avenge it. You do avenge it, and by giving way to someone else's evil, you suffer shipwreck. Why is that? Because Christ is asleep in you. What does it mean that Christ is asleep in you? That you have forgotten Christ. So wake Christ up, remember Christ. Let Christ stay awake in you, think about him. So that's sermon number 63 from St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, which I think is some very solid practical advice of how to think about the moral sense of this passage. Because what we see in this passage is that the disciples, because they have succumbed to fear of the storm, have allowed their faith in Jesus to sleep within them. Now we, as disciples of Jesus in the 21st century, we face a choice. Will we allow our fear and anxiety over the storms in our life, whether those storms are health problems, emotional problems, family problems, career problems? Will we allow these storms to overwhelm and obscure our faith in Jesus? Will we allow our faith in him to sleep in our hearts as the waves grow bigger and bigger? Or will we act in faith knowing and trusting that Jesus' divine care and protection for us is greater and more powerful than any storm which life might throw our way. Now, as we've seen, this section of Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 1 onwards, is leading up to Peter's profession of faith in Mark chapter 8. And beginning from this chapter of the Gospel, Mark chapter 4, Mark is really hammering home the theme of discipleship and what it means to be a disciple. In other words, what it means to be somebody who knows who Jesus Christ is, loves him for who he is, and follows him. And that's the context for the challenge which, which, which this particular gospel passage presents us with. If we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be disciples of Jesus... Are we prepared for the times when the fearful power of the storm seems greater to us than the power of Jesus, true God and true man? To help us reflect on this question that the moral sense of this passage presents us with, here are the words of Pope Francis in his annual Urbi et Orbi address from last year in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic that we're still living through. Now, in this address, Pope Francis called upon this gospel passage from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. He was said, speaking of the coronavirus pandemic, we find ourselves afraid and lost 
like the disciples in the gospel, we were caught off guard by an unexpected, turbulent storm. And then the Pope turns his attention to what happens at the very end of this gospel passage. After Jesus has calmed the storm and asked the disciples, have you no faith? The Pope concludes, we are not self-sufficient. By ourselves we founder. We need the Lord like ancient navigators needed the stars. Let us invite Jesus into the boats of our lives. Let us hand over our fears to him so that he can conquer them. So two great preachers, St. Augustine in the 4th century and Pope Francis in the 21st century, are both calling on us to look at the moral sense of this gospel passage and to invite Jesus into the boat of our hearts so that the storms of this life will not overwhelm our faith in God. That's the moral sense. We're going to turn now to the anagogical sense of this para- of this passage, which in other words is looking for the church in this passage. Because there's another way to understand the significance of the boat in this passage from Mark chapter 4. Because while it is possible to understand the boat as being the human heart of an individual person, we can also understand the boat as being a sign of the church. Because after all, there's a whole community of human beings in the boat together with Jesus, not just one. What we have in this passage is a community of disciples who are with Jesus on a journey. And that is a way of understanding what the church is. Now, the church often speaks of itself as being a pilgrim people. In other words, people on a journey. And that means that when we're looking for the anagogical sense of a passage, the spiritual sense that reveals the church to us, what we need to look for is where there is movement in the passage. After all, that's actually what the word anagogical means. It's from the Greek for moving upwards. So to find the church in a scripture passage, it's a good idea to look for where the movement is the movement towards God, the movement towards eternal life in heaven. And what we have in this passage is the journey of a boat full of disciples together with Jesus. That's where the movement is. Now, the image of the people of God as a boat atop a stormy sea isn't first found in Mark chapter 4. We can find it right back in the Old Testament in Genesis with the story of Noah and the ark. So we read in Genesis chapter 7, The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So Noah's Ark holds the community of righteous humanity. In other words, humanity that lives in right relationship with God. And the Ark protects them from the raging waters, which represent a sinful, fallen world subject to divine punishment. So we can see Noah's Ark as a type. We saw the word type earlier in the paragraph from De Verbum that we read. And we've come back to that word now. Now the word type in the context of the Bible refers to something or someone in the Old Testament who reveals in a very limited and imperfect way something of what Jesus and his church are going to be like once they arrive on the scene in human history. So we read in the Catechism in paragraph 128, the church as early as apostolic times and then constantly in her tradition, has illuminated the unity of the divine plan in the two testaments through typology, which discerns in God's works of the old covenant prefigurations of what he accomplished in the fullness of time in the person of his incarnate son. So we can look to Noah's Ark as a type which is helping us to understand what is being completely, fully and definitively revealed in the actions of Jesus in this gospel passage. We can understand that the boat is holding the community of righteous humanity, namely humanity living in right relationship with God 
the disciples, and that the disciples are protected in their boat from the raging waters of the storm, which the incarnate Lord, who is truly present with them in the boat, calms through his divine power and keeps the disciples safe. So the boat, therefore, reveals to us the church. We, the church, united by our baptismal faith, joined together into the body of Christ, we, as disciples of Christ, are journeying together with Christ in the boat of the church. We're living in right relationship with God, protected from the storms of our fallen world by his grace. So the idea of the church as a boat pops up very early in the Catholic tradition. Back in the second century, the theologian Tertullian wrote a treatise on baptism in which he describes the church as a ship using the biblical image of the calming of the storm, which we read about in this gospel passage. So Tertullian, in his treatise on baptism, writes, that little ship did present a figure of the church in that she is disquieted in the sea, that is, in the world, by the waves, that is, by persecutions and temptations. The Lord, through patience, sleeping as it were, until roused in their last extremities by the prayers of the saints, he checks the world and restores tranquility to his own. Now, when looking at the moral sense, I showed you a passage from a saint, a theologian of the early church, and also a passage from a modern day pope. I'm going to do the same now. Having looked at what Tertullian, the theologian, has to say in the second century about the boat as a type of the church. We're now going to look at what Pope Benedict the 16th had to say about the idea of the church as a boat or a ship in his final address as Pope. So this is what he said about his time as Pope. He said, it has been a stretch of the church's path that has had moments of joy and light, but also difficult moments. I felt like St. Peter and the apostles in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The Lord has given us many days of sunshine and light breezes, days when the fishing was plentiful, but also times when the water was rough and the winds against us, just as throughout the whole history of the church, when the Lord seems to be sleeping. But I always knew that the Lord is in that boat, and I always knew that the boat of the church is not mine, not ours, but is his, and the Lord will not let it sink." So throughout the church's history, from the second century to the 21st century, we have seen the boat in this gospel passage as an image of the church, as an image of the community of Christ's disciples journeying through a world of raging storms, protected by the grace of their Lord Jesus Christ, who alone has the divine power to subdue the wind and the waves. So those are the three spiritual senses of our passage. In the allegorical sense, we found God in the actions of Jesus, which revealed him to be sovereign, not only the storm, but over all evil in created reality. We then turn to the moral sense, and we found the human person by examining the question, will we act out of fear of the storm or out of faith in Jesus? And finally, we looked to the anagogical sense and we found the church in the image of the boat, the community of Christ's disciples shielded by his grace from the storms of a sinful world.